of you were here last week, it was Recognition Sunday, and I had the privilege of being recognized for completing the four-year Education for Ministry program. And when I received my certificate from Kim, uh, I said, you know, sort of spontaneously, I was reflecting back on what I said when I received the certificate, and I said that, you know, I learned a lot, but what I'm really going to take with me are the experiences that I had at EFM. And I was really gonna miss that. So for four years, one night a week, over nine months, each one of those years, for two to two and a half hours, I sh was able to share with other Christians in a fellowship of you know, what I was learning through the readings in, in the curriculum that we had. I was learning from the others, because each year has a different curriculum. <coughs> And we were sharing, we were questioning, we would get off topic, we would be concerned or confused, we would be happy, we would not be happy. We had a lot of different things that we did, but it was this wonderful experience that I can only describe it as a slice of what heaven must be like. And the same experience I think each of us have had in our lives, we've had a godly experience Something brought us to church today. So, something brought us here. And I think it, what it is, is is that kind of desire to have that feeling, that beautiful feeling that lifts you up and carries you out today and into the rest of your week and maybe further than that. Um, we yearn for something, and we think we might find it in this, this room right here. We hope that we do each week that we come. <coughs> Said another way, we want to be fed spiritually. In the epistle reading today, Peter speaks to this, and he uses a metaphorical image of Jesus being a living stone. And I think it's important to think of our relationship to God and to Jesus and to the gift of the Holy Spirit that we have within us as something that is living. With all living things, they must be fed and nurtured and tended to. Peter uses another metaphor of a hungry infant who longs for his mother's milk. And he's giving advice to Christians, saying that if we have tasted that the Lord is good, we should long for pure spiritual food. And Peter doesn't just say, feed your faith. He says, long for feeding your faith. You know, to long for something is to yearn for it, to crave for it, to hunger for it. And we all know when we have yearnings and cravings, we'll seek out and find it. We'll find what we're yearning for. The fourth beatitude from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount is blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. But I don't think we always recognize this hunger that we have as a spiritual appetite. Sometimes we mistake it for something else. And when we mistake it for something else, sometimes things that we do to satisfy that may even draw us further away. In a recent sermon I heard over Easter, the preacher suggested that we all have our favorite little escapes. She said some go on vacation, some have a glass of wine, some read novels, and some drink wine on vacation while they're reading their novel. <laughs> we do some pretty interesting things to fill that void, that hunger. We squelch the yearning or suppress it. And I'm not saying, you know, that vacationing and reading and having an occasional glass of wine is not something we should do. It's a wonderful pastime. But my point is that if we long for a true, deep, fulfilling life, the way to that is to recognize that we are God's creation. And it's only through knowing God 
and experiencing God in our lives, can we truly be fulfilled? It's taken me a lifetime to get this. I spent almost 50 years sort of spinning my wheels around. And rather you know, than honoring the fact that I've been brought into this Christian faith, which Peter says is a chosen race, a royal priesthood, that we are God's own chosen people. You know, I acted like one of the spoiled Disney princesses or princesses that you've seen in a movie where I just want to just be like everyone else. I don't, I don't I want to reject my special stature. I just want to be normal. Even after having tasted that the Lord is good in my life, on many, many occasions, it just took me a while to connect the dots. The chapter that we're reading in John, we're reading from today in John, is part of what's referred to as the Upper Room Discourse, which is part of five chapters in John, from chapters 13 to chapter 17. They're the last words that the disciples are going to hear from Jesus, and he's giving them his personal instructions you know, kind of wrapped up in some comforting words because they're becoming more and more distraught the more they learn as to what's going to be taking place. You know, within hours, Jesus is going to be hanging from a cross. And within less than 24 hours, he would be dead and buried. In the chapter 14, Jesus is preparing his disciples and he's telling them that they can get through what is to come by believing in God and by believing in him? And he's explaining that his departure does have a purpose, that he will be leaving, but he makes it clear to the disciples that they are included in his future plans, and that when he leaves, he's going to be sending an advocate who will dwell within them and who will remind them of everything that he's taught them. And in the first six verses of 14, channel four, chapter 14, these are you know, very comforting words of scripture. And you'll find these words said at funerals. Because you know, like the distraught disciples, family members who are suffering the loss of a dear loved one, someone who has perished, you know, their body and mind has perished, you know, and they're struggling with that and, and so distraught and so sad. And it's so uplifting to be reminded that their spirit is in this special dwelling place. It is still alive and it's living and it's with God and with Jesus in an eternal life. And that one day when it's our time, that we too will join them. But the other several verses in our scripture reading today, verses 6 through 14. They're interesting because some of the questions that the disciples are raising are ones that I've, I know I've asked and I know, you know I've heard been asked. We're still asking those questions today. First, it's Thomas who just simply doesn't understand what Jesus is trying to tell him. You know, he asks, if we don't know where you are going, how can we find you? And Jesus answers, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And if you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. And then Philip, he's like, Lord, just show us the Father and will be satisfied. And Jesus says to him, Have I been with you all the time, Philip? And you still do not know me? And he explains that he is God incarnate. You know, for us, even today, after thousands of years of study and theology and hundreds and hundreds of EFM courses that have gone by, we still have a hard time comprehending some of the words that Jesus says.
to them. It's not easy and maybe we won't comprehend it until we're with him. But I assert that it's not so important that we comprehend it or understand it. You know, what's important is that we experience it, that we witness it in our lives and we see it, you know, like Stephen did. You know, he knew. That's what I mean by connecting those dots. John, in chapter 3, verse 16, says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And to bring humanity into a close relationship with him is why God came to this earth. As human beings, we are prone to sin. We are sinners by nature. And so through Jesus, through the word of God, the Logos, Jesus taught us how to have a full life. And then to establish this new covenant that he has with us, Jesus became the sacrificial lamb for the sins of humanity. And by the grace of God, we have received the righteousness of Christ, and our sins have been forgiven. And when Jesus ascended into heaven, he and the Father sent the Holy Spirit to dwell in us, to be our counselor, our advisor, our advocate. It's a living spirit. God's gift of everlasting life to each of us is a personal relationship with him. He wants nothing more than to have us open our hearts to Jesus, to recognize his eternal power and his divine nature, and to make room for us, for him, in our lives. Make room. Nurture it. Honor the living God. Honor the spirit that dwells in us.